I'm John Perry, and I started the group called Stated Clearly. What we do at Stated Clearly is we take complex scientific topics like genetics and evolution, things like what is DNA and how does it work, what is the evidence for evolution, and can science explain the origin of life, and we take these concepts and we simplify them, and we put them into short animations, things that can be shown in a classroom or you can just watch on YouTube if you'd like. And all of these videos are free to watch on our website at statedclearly.com. And we've got flyers in the back. As you're exiting, there's a table outside the door where you can grab a flyer, some stickers, or some other little things out there. So make sure to grab that if you're interested. But today I'm going to be talking about my favorite subject of all time. The thing that really got me interested in science in the first place, and that is evidence for evolution in your own backyard. This is a picture of me. I'm the, I'm the kid in the middle, kind of looking at the camera. Got my twin brother there, my little brother there, and our dog, Chester. And Chester is probably the main reason that I love science. He was my first interaction with a, a non-human creature uh, on a regular basis. And I was just, from day one, fascinated with this guy. I wanted to learn how he understood the world how he was different than me, how he was the same as me. And one of my earliest memories is laying in the yard with him, petting him, and realizing for the first time that how, how similar he was. I was paying attention to the bones that were in his body as I was petting him. I realized that he had a, he had a rib cage, just like I did. He had, his front legs had shoulder blades, like, like I, I, I have. And his back legs were attached to hips, just like mine. And that was just an amazing little realization that I had, that he was built just like I am. And if you look at a dog, they, they've got a kneecap and a normal knee just like we have, and they have what I thought was a backwards knee, this funny looking thing on the end of their leg facing backwards. And I started feeling that and, and exploring it, and I realized that's actually his heel bone. There's, he's got a tendon just like I have in my heel. This means that dogs walk around on their tiptoes. And I was so excited about this that I told everybody I knew. <laughs> it was the thing I kept talking about at dinner. And the reason I was so excited about this is that I realized, this was, this was a turning point for me as a little kid, I realized that I can learn stuff from my parents, I can learn stuff from books, but I can also learn stuff by just exploring, by just looking at the world and being curious and using my brain. And that that sparked a whole uh, new world of exploration for me. A few, a few years later, I was watching a, a nature documentary by David Attenborough, and I really liked this guy because when he would look at animals, when he would explore, he had the same kind of joy that I had when I was doing this exploration. So I really kind of, he was kind of my hero. And he, in this nature documentary, he, he taught me about evolution for the very first time. I'd never heard about it before. And the theory of evolution is very simple, but it makes some extremely bold claims about living things. First of all, all life on Earth is related. We all share a common ancestor. The second bold claim of evolution is that life evolved through natural processes, things that we can understand. We can actually study these and understand them. And that that was really exciting for me. I can actually learn why my dog is similar to me and why he's different from me by studying, by looking at how the world works. Now, evolution is, is powered by a couple of different processes. One of the most important is descent with modification, and this simply means that when parents have offspring, those offspring are slightly different than each other and slightly different than their parents. So here I've shown that in this little cartoon that these children have different colors that they're born with. The other, another very important aspect of evolution, process of evolution, is natural selection. And this simply means that in any given environment, some creatures will be uh, more fit for survival within their particular environment, some will be less fit. So here we see our chameleon coming in and selecting everybody who does not look like a leaf. If you allow descent with modification acted upon by natural selection to occur over multiple generations, eventually you get adaptation. 
a group of animals will, or plants will become more and more fit for survival and reproduction within their particular environments. And, and that was it. That's what I learned. It was absolutely fascinating to me. Anybody guess what these are? Chicken. Someone said chicken. These are chicken feet. And I've got a question. Who here thinks that chickens can swim? Now, I don't mean they can just keep their head over water if you throw them in a pool, but actually swim with purpose. Just a handful of people. Who thinks they cannot swim with purpose? All right. Well, let's take a look at the evidence. Does Roxy the chicken, as seen on YouTube... Uh, chickens can actually swim very well, as you can see. Sometimes they do it on, on their own. Uh, she was placed in a swimming pool. But when thinking about evolution, it, if you look at a chicken's feet, you can see that there's a little bit of webbing between their toes. And if you look at your own hands, there's a little bit of webbing between your own fingers. Not very much for most people. Some people have more, some people have less. And the same is true with chickens. Some have more webbing, some have less. And you can easily see, you can easily imagine that if there was an environment that was selecting for swimming chickens, maybe the only good food was in the water, for example, over time, those with more webbing between their toes would be selected for by nature until you, you would eventually get something similar to this. This is a duck's feet. You know. And this type of evolution made a lot of sense to me when I was first learning about it. This is just a straight line in evolution. You go from a little bit of webbing to a lot of webbing. It's a very simple thing to understand in evolution. But shortly after learning about how evolution works, I got stung by a bee. And I looked into how stingers work, because I was curious, after getting stung. And I learned that they are extremely complex structures. So here's a stinger a little bit close, closer up. And if we zoom in even further, we can see how complex the structure is. There's these backwards facing barbs. You have these two barbs, and as they're pushing, as one pushes in and then pulls back, that pulls the entire stinger deeper into your arm or wherever it was that you were stung. And each time that thing pumps, it enters further and further into your skin, pumping venom as it goes. This is an extremely complex structure. And when I learned about how this works, I was baffled, thinking, how on earth could something like this evolve? It seems way too complex. There's too many moving parts. And if we want to understand how complex structures like stingers evolve, we need to understand acceptation. So it's kind of a new vocabulary word for us. But an acceptation is when a trait or organ is found to be useful for a new function, one for which it did not originally evolve. This is an acceptation. He's, this parrot has a back scratching device, which it evolved, but that back scratching device did not originally evolve to be a back scratcher, of course. It's his feather for flight. Now, this is a silly example of acceptation because it's kind of hard to imagine how this could possibly give the parrot a survival advantage. Uh, so that means that evolution probably won't continue shaping feathers for the purpose of scratching backs, but Oftentimes, acceptations are extremely useful for survival and reproduction. Most, most plants have veins in their leaves, and the purpose of these veins is to, to carry sugars and fluids from the leaf to the plant and vice versa. And so these veins have been evolving over time to do that more and more efficiently. If we look at holly leaves, their veins continue to do that purpose, but the, a second purpose has developed. They have spikes on the tips of these leaves. And, and these spikes have developed simply because there was a mutation that occurred that caused the veins to extend past the margin of the leaf. And when they extend past the margin, they dry out and they become prickles. And animals that like to eat plants don't like prickly leaves. And so this gave this plant a survival advantage. And so this is an example of an exaptation that caused a zigzag to occur in evolution. Evolution was pulling leaves to be more and more efficient at fluid exchange. Then there was this mutation that occurred sometime in the past, causing those veins to become uh, a weapon. And now we have holly leaves, which are highly advanced, have these highly advanced weapons on them. Here's another example of a leaf, of a, of a plant who's evolved a, a, the same strategy. 
independently. This is one I found in my own backyard. And these spikes are extremely, extremely successful at getting me not to pull weeds in my yard. So it works. So that's what an exaptation is. When a trait or organ is found to be useful for a new function, one for which it did not originally evolve. Exaptation. Everybody say that? Exaptation? Exaptation. <laughs> so an elephant's trunk is an example of an exaptation. It's a modified nose. Sea lion flippers are modified hands. Sloth hooks, those hooks they use for climbing, are modified fingernails. The wings of birds are modified arms. And this might seem strange because they seem so foreign. They seem so unarm like, like these just completely unique structures. But when we look at a chicken developing the egg, we see that chickens start out with this three clawed hand. And that three clawed hand eventually fuses together into the chicken wing that uh, many of us have become familiar with during football season. Bat wings, same thing. They're modified arms and hands. And we can see that really clearly just by looking at a bat, but also it's even more clear when we look at the embryos developing step by step. This here, we're back to the, the stinger of a honeybee. And so you can probably imagine that I'm going to make the case that the stinger of a, of a honeybee is an acceptation. That's how it evolved. But what from? When I was... I was probably a freshman in high school. I, I've always liked playing in the yard, even you know, today, and catching, in, catching bugs. And I caught a katydid in the yard and was just you know, trying to look at it and check out its anatomy. And I saw what I thought was a giant stinger coming off its abdomen. And so I you know, set it down <laughs> and backed away. And I went to my biology teacher um, in school and I asked, do katydids have stingers? Because I did not think they had stingers. And he said, no, they have ovipositors. And an ovipositor, ovi means egg, positor means you know, depositor. So it's, it's an egg depositing device. And a lot of insects have these. And what she uses it for, she'll stab into the ground. Only the females have these, by the way. She'll stab into the ground and she'll lay her eggs in the soil. And that way they're safe. They can grow there and, until they're ready, and then they can emerge. Now, like I said, lots of insects have ovipositors. We haven't been able to work out perfectly the origin of them through the fossil record because it's so spotty in the, in the origin of, of the ovipositor. But many insects have them. Some are very simple, like this grasshopper. Its ovipositor is basically a scraping device. It, it just kind of scrapes the ground and lays its eggs in there as well. And there are very complex ovipositors, like the one found on the cicada. The ovipositor of the cicada is strikingly similar to the stinger of a bee. If we look at it close up, we see that they're very, every structure is essentially the same. We've got a, uh, a stabilizing rod that first stabs in. They're not stabbing into people or animals. They're stabbing into trees. And then we've got these digging blades that carve open the bark, in the case of the cicada, and the digging blades that dig into your skin, in the case of a bee. These function in exactly the same way. And the cicada uses this to carve a hole in a tree and lay her eggs inside. Moving forward, we have wasp ovipositors. And wasps, many species of wasp, actually lay their eggs inside living animals other living creatures. This wasp is injecting her eggs into a caterpillar. And the next image I'm going to show you is a little bit gruesome. <laughs> but those will hatch out of that caterpillar. And uh, that's how they start their lives. <laughs> Back to bees. I, I, I had known for a long time, I don't know if I learned this in school or watching too many nat nature documentaries or what it was, but I had learned that worker bees are females. They can sometimes lay eggs. Queen bee is a female. Her job is to lay eggs. And drone bees are males. And this assumption that I had developed, I, with all these things that I had learned about ovipositors, I had been stung by this bee, I came up with a theory. 
And the theory that I had was that bee stingers evolved from ovipositors. It turns out I'm not the first person to come up with this theory. It's actually been written about extensively for many years, but I didn't know that <laughs> at the time. I, I figured bee stingers must be modified ovipositors. That's what they are. And in science, when we have a theory, a theory uh, is an explanation that explains multiple facts that have been observed. And we can use a theory to come up with a prediction or a hypothesis. And so the hypothesis or the prediction that I came up with is that if the stinger of a bee is in fact a modified ovipositor, male bees should not have stingers. Uh, that was my prediction. And I did a little bit of investigation work and I realized that, in fact, my prediction was correct. Male bees do not have stingers. Instead, they have a little bit of uh, fuzz on their rear. And what this told me is that the theory that I had come up with is supported by the evidence. The stinger of a bee is, in fact, a modified ovipositor. So what is the moral of this story? Next time you're stung by a bee, you've actually been wounded by the modified reproductive organs of a lady insect. <laughs> Thanks.